<laughs> Hello, welcome members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for this Easter special. Our names are Ammon, Topher, and Micah, and we are the Three Brothers. Brothers. <laughs> welcome to this week's Come Follow Me discussion, where we will give you our favorite insights, and then we talk about them. Correct. And as always, everything we talk about is free. Uh, you'll find links below this video uh, that will uh, link you to the weekly weedings paper, which we use to study from. And in that paper, you'll find the Come Follow Me uh, lesson for this week in black. You'll find the scriptures in gold and you'll find the other church manuals in purple, all collated in nice order. that actually put together for us a fantastic document to read through and study from because you don't have to go looking elsewhere. And uh, along with that, you'll also find the insights that we talk about um, as well linked there. Uh, and again, we'd like to thank Ashley for putting that together and for others who record this and put it on our YouTube channel. Um, if you'd like to listen or watch for some reason, uh, <laughs> the readings for the week, they are on our YouTube channel as well. Um, it can be really handy to just listen to in the background if you don't have the time to, to, to read, but I think reading is always the best option if you can, I suppose. Um, and that's what we do here. And without further ado, do <laughs> we're coming at you. And Mike is first. No, I'm first. I oh, that's what we're doing. I was no, sorry. I was like, all right, I can go. We're all over the show. We're all over the show. All right. <laughs> Right before okay. we right okay. before we start, Topher's like, "Okay, yeah. we're gonna change like, this yeah, up. I'll be first, I'm gonna right? go first. Yeah, and then oh, as soon man. as he goes, okay, my guy, you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so confused. Uh, okay, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> all right. So, um, this is um, I mean, it's not that long of a an insight. Um, it's pretty much this is pretty much a culmination of kind of everything I wanted to to mention from from the readings this week. Obviously, it's Easter, um, so it's um. A really good bunch of reading this week, all about the the resurrection, you know, the atonement and the resurrection of the Savior. Um, so there's one particular thing that I, you know, you kind of have like a what is it, an epiphany or whatever. That's what I and I had, kind of had that, and I, and I've tried to word it and put it here. So I hope it comes out the way I had it in my mind. But anyway, we'll see how we go. So I just want to start with um, the church on its Instagram page. So the Church of Jesus Christ Instagram page. They put out little clips, little videos all the time. <laughs> and this week, obviously, I mean, so last week were all about International you know, Women's Day. It was International Women's Day. So they had a whole bunch of different clips about that. This week's Easter, they got a whole bunch of clips about that. And so um, I just want to start with um, that a few really good ones. And one from Ronald A. Rasband, which was actually taken from his April 2023 general conference talk. Uh, I just can't remember what it was called, but um, they have a cool little clip on there from him. And so this is taken from that um, and then builds off it. So he says, nearly 2,000 years ago, Palm Sunday, which was last Sunday, marked the beginning of the last week of the mortal ministry of Jesus Christ. It was the most important week in human history. That's cool. What began with the heralding of Jesus as the promised Messiah in his triumphant entry into Jerusalem closed with his crucifixion and resurrection. By divine design, his atoning sacrifice concluded his mortal ministry, making it possible for us to live with our Heavenly Father for eternity. Scriptures tell us that the week began with throngs standing at the gates of the city to see Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. I just anyway, I like that little clip, and there's obviously shows bits and pieces, and there's a bit more in, in that clip. So, but I, I thought it was a really good start uh, for what I want to talk about. So, his his um he's he's talking from um I, I can't remember the chapter in John, um, but talking about the palm trees and things that that comes from John, and in Matthew, the the book of Matthew, he records slightly different version of the same thing. So Matthew twenty one verses seven to nine, it says, um. Uh, and this is talking about the apostles and brought the ass and the colt and put them on the put on them their clothes and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, 
Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So in this account, we get um, not only people cutting down branches, it doesn't even specify palm branches, but we get that from John. So you use, use both to get the full context. So they took palm tree branches and laid them down, and then others took their garments and laid them down for him to walk over um, on his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Um, now, I just want to give some historical context to this. So palm branches were often used in the celebration of victory, and in King David's time, they were used to honor royalty. So you get the idea here. This fact of the history of palm branches makes a perfect connection to the true identity of Jesus as the King of Kings. Not only that, but palm branches also represent Jesus being worthy as the high priest for all who believe. A palm tree takes 30 this is cool. A palm tree takes 30 years to bear fruit, and a man could not become a high priest until he was 30 years old. The ministry of Jesus began when he was 30 years old. Um, people's cloaks or garments were also spread out on the road for the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Uh, this was more than just an act of honor. This was also an acknowledgement and declaration that Jesus was the King of Kings and the promised Messiah. And this is some cool uh, context I didn't know. Uh, the word garment here is the tallet or prayer shawl, which was a seamless garment with four corners, uh, with a tassel attached to each of the four cor corners to remind the Jewish people of the commands of God. Upon its collar, the Hebrew letters spell Lord of Lord, Lords and King of Kings as a symbolic reminder of the promised Messiah. By laying their talents down, the people were acknowledging Jesus as God's promised Messiah. They were declaring that Jesus was the only one worthy to be called the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So you get this really cool um, context of what they were really doing by laying these palm branches down and, and, and their garments down for him to, to sort of triumphantly walk over. Um, I just think it's a really cool um, visual thing. And it often, I, I don't know how much we often think about what they were sort of doing there. Um, now, I don't want to go to Revelation 7. Um, and uh, I'm going to read verses, verse 9 and then verse 14. And I just want to note that the people I'm talking about in these verses, in the chapter heading, it calls them the multitude exalted from all nations. So Revelation 7. And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindred, kindreds and tongues and peoples, sorry, and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And I said unto him, Sir, thou, oh, sorry, he asked a question right before this. Who are these people? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, so you might start seeing this connection with what I'm talking about here is, you know, our, our, our robes, our clothes, and, and washing them white through um, the Savior's atonement. So how do we wash our robes and make them white with the blood of the Lamb? Um, Elder Lynn A. Mickelson in uh, uh, General Conference in 2003, he had a, a, a really good little talk. It was called The Atonement, Repentance, and Dirty Linen. Um, it's a really great talk, and I, this is just a part from it. There is a parallel between our garments being washed clean through the blood of the Lamb and how we wash our own dirty linen. It is through his atoning sacrifice that our garments will be cleansed. The scriptural reference to garments encompasses our whole being. The need for cleansing comes as we become soiled through sin. The judgment and forgiving are the Savior's prerogative, for only he can forgive and wash away our sins. So what should we do with dirty linen? The process begins with repentance. The Savior stands at the door and knocks. He is ready to, re to receive us immediately. There's also really, I mean, if you want to think about it, really an interesting tie-in with that, with that visually for me in the temple and what we do in the temple, and that's all I'll say on that. He's ready to receive us immediately. Our responsibility is to do the work of repentance. We must abandon our sins so the cleansing can begin. The promise of the Lord is that he will cleanse our garments with his blood. He gave his life and suffered for all our sins. He can redeem us from our personal fall through the atonement of the Savior. Sorry, through the atonement of this of the Savior, giving himself as the ransom for our sins, he authorizes the Holy Ghost to cleanse us in a baptism of fire. As the Holy Ghost dwells in us, his purifying presence burns out the filthiness of sin. As soon as the commitment is made, the cleansing process begins. 
so this is not new stuff you know we we, we know what, what what this is but um i just that was a really good way of wording it um and i just want to end with some questions from alma the high priest in alma chapter five that he asked the people as he taught throughout the land uh, so alma chapter five i'm going to read verse 21 and 27 i say unto you you will know at that day that you cannot be saved for then no, there can no man be saved except his garments are washed white Yea, his garments must be purified until they are cleansed from all stain through the blood of him of whom it has been spoken by our fathers who should come to redeem his people from their sins. And these are the questions I like he, he asks here. Have you walked keeping yourselves blameless before God? Could you say if you were called to die at this time within yourselves that you have been sufficiently humble? That's an interesting question. Uh, that your garments have been cleansed and made white through the blood of Christ, who will come to redeem his people from their sins. So just lastly, my thoughts here. This week, we celebrate the atonement and resurrection of our Savior. He rode into Jerusalem over the palm branches and the garments of those who believed and who were desirous to be saved from their sins. Are our lives continually laid down before him? Have we laid down our palm branches of celebration of victory and joy for him? and his atonement and sacrifice for us? Have we laid down our garments before him so that they can be washed clean and become white through the blood of his triumphant atoning sacrifice? And that's that. So I just really like that, I don't know, the visual aspect of laying your garments down, knowing that those who are exalted at the end have their garments washed white through the atonement of Jesus Christ. That whole visual sort of, I don't know, it's really, I don't know, I really liked it. You know, something that you actually put in there that I I didn't make the connection to, or I might not have even known, was that the, their clothes, those things you mentioned there, that they were the prayer shoals. So they were actually prayer, um, I'm not like towels or rugs or things people actually pray on. And mm -hmm. and I thought, well, that's so interesting because, um, and as you were reading that, I thought, oh, that's so interesting because, um, that relates to Revelation chapter seven and eight. And then you read Revelation chapter seven. And I was like, well, that's so cool because the prayers, he he comes because of the prayers. And and the first time he came, they throw, threw those down and he wrote over them. But the, the second time he comes, he's in heaven coming down. It's, it's different. He'll, he'll actually be coming not as a lamb this time, but as a lion, but it'll actually be, um, this direction that he'll be coming in. Likewise manner, have you seen me go? Shall I return? And uh, it is once again, because of the prayers of the saints, it is, uh, you know, the, the pray night and day until deliverance comes. Pray always that you may be uh, counted worthy to escape all these things. Um, uh, pray, uh, as, as the Lord said, uh, with the importuning widow, right? And he once again reaffirmed it in the doctrine and covenants wary the Lord with your prayers, and then I will come out of my hiding place and vex the nations. That's actually what he says in Dr. Covenant. So it's this prayers, prayers, prayers thing. And what's interesting is that if you keep reading in Revelation chapter seven, so you just keep reading and you go into Revelation chapter eight, it says that another angel came and stood by the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the, the angel's hand. So once again, confirming and tying that in that uh, the, the, the prayer shoals and, and the, the uh, prayers ascending up to heaven and the uh, um, people surrounding the throne, they're all connected. It's, it's all just... Uh, the, the the second the first coming and the second coming are just it's it's not you know what it's almost like instead of calling it the the first coming and the second coming it's almost like we should call it the finishing like re really it's it's all part of the same thing right and i think that's kind of the, the the problem when we call it the second coming we think it's we we treat it like it's just a singular event and we keep having to say like no no it's a series of events in fact when jesus appeared to joseph in the grove that was part of the second coming right and uh, him appearing in the Kirtland Temple, that was a part of the second coming, right? Like, it, it's, it, you know, and we need to look at it more like that. We're like, the Lord's been around since the Old Testament. He was Jehovah. He was God of the Old Testament, right? 
And it, so he, he when he came, you know, when he was born in Bethlehem, that wasn't his even his first coming or his first appearance. He was around, right? He appeared to the brother of Jared, right? So, I mean, like he, he's been, a, he, he, it's more like he came in the meridian of time to fulfill the atonement and he's going to c- come again to finish his work and, uh, and how it's always the same cycle. It's always the same process that we have to go through. And he's just, in every single case, we went in the old Testament with that, with the children of Israel it was always the same. He was just trying to create that people, trying to create that Zion society. And it was the same thing in Jerusalem. Isn't it so sad to to, to re- realize, and maybe people don't realize this, but he didn't have to do the atonement like that. He could, he would have still had to do the atonement, but he could have actually ridden in as king of kings and the Jews could have accepted him and he still could have done the atonement. He didn't have to be rejected by his own, like none of that was a, a had to have happened uh, situation. It just did, and uh, and and once again, it's like here we are in the last dispensation. And it's like we have the chance to build the tower. We have the we have the same opportunity, and will we arise to it and make our our robes white in the blood of the Lamb? And what's so so reassuring about um, those verses you read in Revelation is that it is going to happen. There will be those surrounding the throne. It's going to happen this time. It might not have happened to the children of Israel. It might not have happened in the millennium of time, but it's going to happen this time. It's just a matter of, is Micah going to be among them? Right? That's the only question. The only question is, am I going to be among them? You know, if it's not me, it's going to be somebody. Somebody's going to have done the work and made their their robes white in the blood of the lamb. And they're going to be able to do the same things, the palm leaves and, and, and their prayers and so forth. And they're going to be able to surround that throne. And uh, finally, that work is going to start to finish. What a glorious thing. Yeah. Really, really great comments. It it made me think, um, when you're talking about the prayers the saints are sending up to heaven and up to the, the, the ears of the Lord, I was thinking about a, a cool experience that I shared with you guys. And some. A part, a very short part of a very great long quote from Elder Heber C. Kimball came to my mind, which was, before that day comes, which is the cleansing of Missouri in preparation for Zion to be built in Jackson County, however, the saints will be put to a test that will try the integrity of the best of them. The pressure will become so great that the more righteous among them will cry unto the Lord day and night until deliverance comes. So what I gather from that is it's that same concept. It's that the Lord moves to action when the saints that are trying to do the right thing plead unto him for assistance. They plead unto him to come, to be, you know, come conqueror into Jerusalem. Let's welcome, throw down your palm leaves, throw down your garments. We accept your atonement. We accept you're the Messiah. Come, come and be our king. And that was the first time that he did it. And then there's the finishing of that. He will do that again. And just like that quote, just from that quote, he will do that. One of the first aspects of that second coming return will happen in Missouri after it's been cleansed. It it gets cleansed. The Savior then will build up his city there, his city of holiness, where he will come and rule as king of kings. And it was, it's always, like you were saying, it's always the same process. You look at the, Hebrews in Egypt, they were crying day and night unto the Lord for for deliverance from the bonds of the Egyptians. And then the Lord heard their pleas, and he was moved to call Moses to set his people free. In our day, it's the same thing. We cry night and day to the Lord for deliverance until deliverance comes. The Lord hears the message, then the Lord acts through his prophet to deliver his people. None of us here listening, I'm sure, are unaware that when Zion is redeemed, it will be redeemed by power. It'll be redeemed by the Lord making bare his holy arm, which is exactly, and the only other time that we know, the only other time that that wording, the Lord making bare his holy arm has been used in scripture is with what he did to the Egyptians. He came out and the, the miracles were obvious in front of the eyes of all nations, the things that Moses was able to do because of the Lord's power. And in our day, 
the miracles and and the incredible power that's going to come upon upon and through the prophet and upon and through his the lord's people is going to be so obvious and so insane that people will have to just say this is the work of the lord so Night and day, we need to pray for deliverance. We have to get out of Babylon. We've got to get out of Dodge. And like Joseph Smith teaches, we have to flee to Zion when the opportunity arises. Nice additional comments. Really good. It's cool. I don't know. It's kind of cool how it all ties together, isn't it? You know, you know, uh, and Alma, Alma says, have you been sufficiently humble? You know, and as part of that, are you laying, are you laying your, your, Prayer shawls down, you know. Are you, are, you, are you falling out night and day? Are you praying for these things. You praying for deliverance. You pray, you know. And uh, and if you if you're doing enough, he will uh, he will come and redeem us from our from our sins. And uh, yeah, nice. Okay. Well, now it's Micah's turn. Now, now it's Micah's turn again. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I'll allow it. Oh, you'll allow it. <laughs> I'll allow it. I'll allow it this time, soldier. All right, perfect. <laughs> okay, so um, my insight, scrolling back up. Now, uh, people from Zion or Bus might be familiar with a lot of the things that I'm going to be sharing today. But, uh, you know, since this is an Easter special, and since there may be those that will be will randomly stumble across this video, um, I, I think it's it, it's good to, to, to put these these together and get, get this out here and add my testimony to this. But uh, even more than that, I, 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 even though we have read these, these quotes a lot and shared aspects of them with each other in Zyner bus, I want people uh, I'm hoping that maybe this Easter season, uh, we stop with so much of the eggs and chocolate. And we remember that without the savior, none of these things would be possible. Like he is, he is the reason why these things happen. He is the therefore, and um, and that these are the things that he wants us. As far as this finishing of the work, he, these are the things he wants us to look for, and these are the, some of the things that he wants us to prepare for. Um, Darren actually shared this uh, Elder Maxwell quote on Discord just the other day, and I thought, man, it ties in so perfectly with these concepts. And so I threw this in here at the beginning here. And so Elder Neil A. Maxwell says, the resurrected Jesus made a special point of ensuring that this glorious event witnessed alike on two he hemispheres in and in which all mortal mortals have an inexpressibly important and personal stake was likewise carefully recorded. Talking about once we're talking about the resurrection of saints around the time of Jesus's resurrection. In fact, Jesus noted the neglect of Samuel's prophecy commanded that it be written. No wonder, for he anticipated the subsequent reactions to the reality of the resurrection, such as those of the Anthonians to Paul's preaching. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Jesus, the Jehovah of the Old Testament, who had been so careful to see that much lesser facts were carefully established in the mouths of two or three witnesses, insisted that the two central facts of human history, the atonement and the resurrection, be carefully established in the pages of the two great written witnesses of him and the resurrection. Such careful correlation in and amplified attesting would surely not surprise previous prophets, nor should it us. Preaching about the resurrection and the resurrection of, of specific individuals should not surprise previous prophets, nor should it us. I think that's a great point, and I think that a lot of people will go, oh, yeah, obviously, but then when you bring up certain people like Joseph Smith, people go, wait, wait. You know, and they get a little bit weird. It's like, well, why? Why should the resurrection of Joseph Smith, why should that surprise us? The above is not uh, recited just to note how reassuredly tidy the restored gospel is, nor how impressively exacting about facts the Lord is. Instead, one should ask, what knowledge does the world need to have more 
than the sure testimony and evidence that Jesus is the Christ and that his atonement actually accomplished God's great plan of redemption, whereby mankind will be blessed with immortality. Right? Why? Why? A better question we ask, why? What does this knowledge teach us? Why did he want it in here so explicitly? In a world filled increasingly with drift, disbelief, and despair, what more welcome good news could be given, end quote. So I'm going to turn to Dr. Covenant 63. Why? Why is it that these things were preached? What was the therefore, right? Yea, and blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from henceforth. When the Lord shall come and old things shall pass away and all things become new, they shall rise from the dead and shall not die after. So there's the resurrection. And shall receive an inheritance before the Lord in the holy city. That's the new Jerusalem. Wherefore, for this cause preach the apostles unto the world the resurrection of the dead. Here's the Lord giving us the very reason why he wanted this recorded time and time again. These things are the things that ye must look for. So once again, people who are always talking about last day timelines and events and how the Lord told us to look for the season and the times of the season and that it shouldn't come as a thief in the night for those that believe in the Lord. And, and they, they go through all of this and then they immediately go to apocryphal writing. What does the Lord say in the Doctrine and Covenants? The Lord gives us the answer. These are the things that you must look for, meaning the resurrection and specifically the resurrection of specific people. And speaking after the manner of the Lord, they are now nigh at hand and in a time to come, even in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. And until that hour, so until the at what hour? The hour that you're looking for, the hour of these re resurrections, there will be foolish versions among the wise. And at that hour cometh an entire separation of the righteous and the wicked. And in that day will I send mine angels to pluck out the wicked and cast them into unquenchable fire. End quote from Dr. Covenant. So a future day from us, President Nelson said, the day is coming when those who obey the Lord will be separated from those who do not and referenced the wheat and the tares, these very scriptures, right? Moses chapter seven, verse 62. And righteousness will I send down out of heaven and truth will I send forth out of the earth to bear testimony of mine only begotten, his resurrection from the dead, yea, and also the resurrection of all men. And righteousness and truth will I cause to sweep the earth as with a flood to gather out mine elect from the four quarters of the earth unto a place which I shall prepare, unholy city, that my people may gird up their loins and be looking forth for the time of my coming. So all of this happens before the final coming, the great and dreadful day, for there shall be my tabernacle and it shall be called Zion, a new Jerusalem. Joseph Smith on the teaching of the page, uh, teaching the prophet Joseph Smith, page 84, talking about this, the glorious resurrection, taught us the following. Joseph Smith says, now I understand by this quotation that God clearly manifested to Enoch the redemption which he prepared by offering the Messiah as a lamb, lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. And by virtue of the same, the glorious resurrection of the Savior and the resurrection of all the human family even a resurrection of their corporeal bodies is brought to pass. And also righteousness and truth are to sweep the earth as with a flood. And now I ask how righteousness and truth are going to sweep the earth as with a flood. I will answer men and angels, resurrected beings are to be co-workers in bringing to pass this great work. And Zion is to be prepared, even a new Jerusalem, for the elect that are to be gathered from the four quarters of the earth and to be established unholy city for the tabernacle of the Lord shall be with them. End quote from Joseph Smith. So now we're starting to hopefully see why it was that the Lord wanted to make sure that the apostles preach this. In Genesis chapter 9, reading the, the JST of it, of course, starting verse 22, and this is my everlasting covenant that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. And the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven, 
and possess the earth and shall have place until the end come. Once again, confirming what? This happens before the end. And this is my everlasting covenant, which I have made with thy father, Enoch. Okay. Going back to the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, we cannot be perfect without our dead. Joseph Smith teaches the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. The mustard seed is small, but brings forth a large tree and the fowls lodge in the branches. The fowls are the angels. Thus, angels come down, combine together to gather their children and gather them. We cannot be made perfect without them, nor they without us. When these things are done, meaning this has to happen first, the Son of Man will descend, the Ancient of Days sit. We may come to an innumerable company of angels, have communion with and receive instruction from them. Paul told about Moses' proceedings, spoke of the children of Israel being baptized. He knew this, and that all the ordinances and blessings were in the church. Paul had these things, and we may have the fowls of heaven lodged in the branches, etc. End quote from the teaching of the prophet Joseph Smith there, and, and from Joseph Smith. I personally testify that because of the Lord's atonement, his sacrifice and resurrection, the resurrection of the whole human family is brought to pass. I know that even a resurrection of their corporeal bodies is brought to pass. And also righteousness and truth will sweep the earth as with a flood. I know that as we look up, Zion will look down. I know these are the things that we are commanded to look for with regards to the redemption of Zion and building of new Jerusalem and Christ's second coming there too. I also add my testimony to that of President Young, who said that the Gentiles will be as much mistaken in regard to his second advent as the Jews were in relation to the first, end quote. And the Lord himself, who said in 35 chapter 21, for in that day for my sake shall the Father work a work which shall be a great and a marvelous work among them, and there shall be among them those who will not believe it, although a man shall declare it unto them. But behold, the life of my servant shall be in my hand. Therefore they shall not hurt him, although he shall be marred because of them. Yet I will heal him. For I will show unto them that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. End quote. May we be looking for the right things this Easter season is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> awesome. Timely and uh, well put together as usual. Uh, really illustrates, I mean, what, what's Easter about? Remembering, in particular, the resurrection of the Savior, right? And uh, the importance that has for him as our Savior, but also for the whole human family, as you pointed out, really um, a good way to use this season to to reiterate that 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 point. Um, I can't improve and or add to it, this in any like with any real um, benefit, except I'll just add the things that stood out to me. I like in the Elder Neil A. Maxwell quote. He says, "What knowledge does?" The world need to have more than the sure testimony and evidence that Jesus is the Christ and that his atonement actually accomplished God's great plan of redemption, whereby mankind will be blessed with immortality. What knowledge does the world need to have more than the sure testimony and evidence that Jesus is the Christ? Okay, so to answer that question, they don't need anything more than that, but what they do need after that, so the, the resurrection, the atonement and resurrection of the Savior is number one, most important thing. But what else could they use uh, or more should they have after that? Especially knowing what's coming up. And you've uh, you know, iterated this all here. The resurrection of everyone, but particularly what are, we, what are we looking for? The resurrection of Joseph Smith and the establishment of the New Jerusalem, which comes because of the resurrection that will take place in the latter days. So... The Savior and his resurrection is, you know, and his atonement, that's that number one. What 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 other knowledge should we have? The fact that the resurrection of everyone else will occur in the latter days. Uh, and that men and angels sweep the earth as a flood. 
how because of this resurrection um and the way that all these wonderful works happens in the last days is because of it which i don't know it's kind of cool like uh, you know I, I would hazard most people don't even think about this or understand it um pretty crazy to think about to be quite honest with you it, it makes you wonder how anyone will sort of not believe anymore at the end there when when we're working so hand in hand uh with with angels right i mean you call angel resurrected beings um it's amazing but what it also says um and i forget where it was in there but it might have been in the doctrine and covenants there yeah verse 54 so doctrine and Covenants 63 verse 54 and until that hour there'll be foolish virgins among the wise that's crazy so there's going to be foolish virgins, people who are unready among the wise. And what do the wise have? They have knowledge. They have understanding. They're not ignorant. They're wise. So there's going to be foolish and unprepared people among those who actually know and understand. That's that's interesting and kind of scary, to be honest. Um, so I think, again, very, very important that this is reiterated so that we understand what we are looking for in the last days because uh, people probably don't expect. And again, you say, Joseph Smith's going to be resurrected and people hear this for the first time and go, what? What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> You're like, how is this to be? You know, um, Well, we're all going to be resurrected for a start. So, you know, it's not that crazy, but, uh, you know, but his resurrection and the establishment of the new Jerusalem and all these things that happen hand in hand with angels is, has to come as you've laid out here before the second coming. It's, it's all tied together. Um, and so really, really cool. I, re I really like how this is all laid out in, in that order and it's very easy to follow and to understand. And I really appreciate that. Um, and just like you, uh, I'll end by saying it's all because of Jesus's resurrection, which again is the reason for this wonderful season. Um, and so it's all because of that. And that is the central aspect to, to the whole thing. So truly grateful for that, but yeah, really awesome. I don't even know where to start with this. It's so good. It is so good. And it just makes me think. It just makes me feel really ungrateful, to be honest. How many saints know about this stuff? How many saints know that we're supposed to be looking? I reckon like most don't. Mm. Well, when don't it think comes, about it. yeah, when it comes to the second coming, and and right now we live in a time where I think a, a good chunk, a very good percentage of our active Latter Day Saints believe the second coming is at least close. How many of those people, that significant percentage, who at least believe it's close, are looking looking towards the resurrection, are looking towards the very thing that they were su supposed to be looking forward to, the sign of the resurrection, and in particular, specifically, beginning with the resurrection of an individual to kick it all off, the end sign, Joseph Smith. How many people know that? How many people understand it? I just, I feel a little bit ungrateful and, and it's true when you tell people about that, generally the first reaction is, Ooh, brother, Ooh, you know, it's, it's, they, they just, it seems almost too much. And because it's not pounded from a pulpit, I think people will struggle to get into anything that's not pounded from a pulpit, anything that requires any kind of personal input, personal study reading something longer than three lines, listening to something that isn't just immediate sunshine and rainbows. I think most of our members can't handle that, generally speaking. And maybe that's the reason that they don't get the, the hidden, not hidden, the mysteries of the kingdom. Because the mysteries of the kingdom only come to those that actually seek and that actually knock. So I feel a little bit ungrateful in the vast population of Latter-day Saints that has any kind of concept or understanding of this because this is very very special stuff very very special and it begins with joseph smith and then it continues in earnest with our ancestors we are their children they yearn over us they love us our hearts are turned to them and we save them through our temples their hearts are turned towards us and they want to physically return so that they can gather us in now what kind of a gathering are we talking about here when President Nelson is going, the gathering, the gathering, the gathering, and we hear it all the time, we hear it all the time, uh, most people's initial impression is, oh, it's a spiritual gathering. You know, we're gathering spiritually. We're, missionaries are teaching people the gospel. We're learning the gospel. We're being gathered in. We're being gathered into the church. Well, do we really think that's why in this time, in the latter days, that these physically, 
perfected beings are being resurrected together because they need to teach us spiritually? Why do we need physically perfected, resurrected beings with the power of God to gather us spiritually? That's our job. We're supposed to be gathering everyone spiritually. No, they're coming back to gather us literally in Joseph's own, Joseph Smith's own words. They're coming back to gather us into a specific place. They're coming to gather us into Zion. And they, they can do that because now they have the physical bodies to do it. And they can do that because ever since their bodies were separated from their spirits, until the time that they were rejoined, they longed for the day when they would return to that holy city, Doctrine and Covenants section 101, and receive their crowns of glory. That's the whole purpose for them coming back. It's to come back and to bring their family in because they have a responsibility over us, because they love us, and with them, go to Zion to receive their crowns. That's what they've been waiting for this whole time. That's what they've been waiting for. This process of the resurrection is the facilitation method to bring about the complete and final last day's physical gathering in unto Zion, the new Jerusalem. And I feel like I feel like I've got the cheat codes. I feel like I'm ungrateful because this is special. And who knows this stuff? Who gets this stuff? Not enough. Not enough people. So, man, I hope everyone that listens to this today, if you're not fully down with the concept, you don't really understand what we're talking about, read, reread, and reread again all of these references that Mike has got in, in this point. Please, please understand what's going on here. And if the resurrection of Joseph Smith is confusing at all to kickstart all of this, go back on the channel and have a look at the return of Joseph Smith papers and videos. So do yourself a favor. If you really want to understand what we should be looking for with regard to the Savior's return, which is everything that we're talking about, the Savior was resurrected and then he left. He's not the King of Kings on the earth at the moment. He hasn't been for 2000 years. He hasn't been ever. But for 2000 years, he hasn't even been physically walking the earth with us generally but he did promise of a day when he would do that and it's immediately following the resurrection of one particular man in these latter days then our ancestors then we're gathered to that holy city so he can come down and be that ruler so if you want to look forward to that day when we we get round two of this amazing person the best person that ever lived that's what you're looking for and I plead with you to understand it. Otherwise, it's going to be, as it says in 3 Nephi chapter 21, this is the marvelous work. This is the great and marvelous work among them. And there shall be many among them who will not believe it, although a man shall declare it unto them. If you can't get your head around it now, imagine when someone just comes and goes, hey, look, everyone's getting resurrected. You'll be like, ah, not happening. Get your head around it now. Open the, your doors of understanding so that you can access the power of faith and exercise it so that the Lord can, with the Spirit, He can test, you can receive the testimony of this. And then you won't be taken by surprise like a thief in the night when all of these events go down and you have to make some very hard decisions. And if and if you haven't, if you haven't hit any of these subjects or you don't know what they are, when you followed the the admonition of president nelson to study the promises made to the house of israel may i humbly suggest that you didn't do much studying because in every single case where it, it talks about the promises made to the house of israel you have exactly what you have here resurrections and receiving an inheritance in the holy city well what does that mean to receive an inheritance in the holy city it's talking about the new Jerusalem. It's talking about a literal plot of land. That like it's talking about an inheritance there. That is literally what it's talking about. And that's what they all long for. That is when we finally have those promises made to the house of Israel are fulfilled. And uh to to just Joseph in that day. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. And by Joseph, I mean the, the tribe of Joseph. So yeah, promises made in the house of Israel. There they are, they are a coming. I just want to add um, 
Amon touched on it there as well. Um, there's a real sense of hope with it as well um, because you just think about anyone who's lost a righteous family member, you know, anyone like in, in our lifetimes or even yep. just, you know, even your grandparents or whatever it may be. There's, imagine this, we're, we're this close to them coming back. You know what I mean? Like that, you're that, you know, so there's a real sense of like, you know, people around us lose their parents all the time, you know, and um, just knowing that they are this close to actually coming back, you know, and they're, beautiful- and they're the, the reason or the help for us to get to the new Jerusalem. They're the actual ones gathering us. So we think we're all doing all this gathering on this side of the veil and doing temple work and stuff like that. It's like, we can't be saved without them. Do you know what that means? What does that mean? Do you understand? Obviously, we are saving them, but how do they save us? Do, do we ever have that answered in the church? Rarely. They save us when they show up physically as resurrected beings and literally gather us to the new Jerusalem. That's just, talk, yeah, hope. Yeah, I mean, talk <laughs> about an awesome experience to get to see these people again and and family members, and, and they're the ones gathering you. Very cool. Think about this too. Very cool. This is a hot, hot topic among Latter day Saints. Oh, you know, the numbers in our church are sort of stagnant, if not sort of, you know, taking a nosedive. But we are building temples at such a rate increase that we've never seen before in history. We're building temples like they're candy, popping like candy. Why? Why are we doing so much work to build all these temples now? If we're if the membership is struggling, what's the focus on temples for right now and temple work right now? Because these dead people who have been waiting so that they can come back and save us, the time period between right now and them coming back to do that is this big. They know, and we ought to know. And so, and the prophet knows, you know. So he's putting up all these temples so that we can get out there and do the work for these people. So that they can immediately come back, like Erastus Snow used to teach. They they're waiting to receive a ticket of leave, so they can come back upon a higher plane, upon a higher sphere, and they can prepare us to gather in unto Zion, the New Jerusalem. That's their role when they come back. So if they if the second coming is close, which we believe it is, and the temple is critical in order to give them the saving ordinances, so they can receive their ticket of leave. To receive a celestial body in the resurrection and come back and save us, then isn't that pointing to why the temple, the temple has become such an incre- incredibly large focus right now? The spirit of Elijah, the turning of the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers so that they can come back. Now's the time. Like we're switching. We're switching from the spirit of Elias. Am I right? to the spirit of Elijah, which is this, the temple work. And when the saviors come, comes to be the king, the spirit of Messiah, and he puts the capstone on all of that work of redemption. I just want to point out too, that it's interesting because I don't think there's an issue with, well, the majority of our members going to the temple, right? I mean, like, you know, I guess there's, there's temple recommend worthy members and there's, those who aren't, I suppose, but let's say all the temple recommend worthy members. I don't think we have an issue with getting them to the temple, but if you think about it, we've just mentioned this as well, that there's probably a big gap between temple worthy members who are doing temple work who don't understand what we've just talked about. You know, so they're doing the work, but they don't actually understand any of this. So they're just doing temple work for the sake of doing temple work when we really need to do it so that all of this can take place, but they don't understand or know about any of this. So that's interesting. So they, it's, you know, is that the foolish virgins among the wise? I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's not, some it's people not bad say, going to the temple, but. And some people say, well, they don't need to know. And then to that, I would say, okay, well, then will the miracle precede the faith? Is that what you're teaching? You're t- teaching that they'll get to participate in a miracle without the faith? Uh, you know, uh, that doesn't seem right, right? Faith always precedes the miracle, right? And so you have to you have to know so that you can order that you can have faith for it. And the other thing is that we just went over in Topher's first point is, will the Lord give it to us without asking for it? And the answer to that is also no. So you have to you have to know about the thing before you can have faith in it, and you have to know about the thing before you can pray for it. 
And so um, it's, it's just not going to happen. So we have to learn about these things. We have to gain faith in these things. And then we have to ask for them. And then we wait patiently for it to happen. You, you can also do anything without real intent. That includes gospel related stuff. You know, I've sat in a, I've sat in pews many a time without real intent. I don't know about you guys, but there's been, there's been many a times in my life where I've sat in the pews where I should be, but without the intent to, to gain anything or give of anything or sacrifice of anything. And therefore I've, I've gained nothing spiritually. I've gained nothing. And can we have that? Can, is it possible to have that experience by being a drone in the temple? I believe that's the same thing, isn't it? Does it, does it matter where you go or what you do if your intent is not pure? If your intent is not there to, for the right reasons and to do the right things? And so you're right, Micah. Like, if we're going to gain anything from the Lord spiritually, when we are offering up our oblations, when we are offering up our sacrifices, when we are offering up our contrite heart, what is it? Contrite spirit and help me out here. Broken Broken heart, heart. contrite spirit. When offering up the broken heart and the contrite spirit, that's when the miracle happens. That's when the faith is produced. That's when the Lord comes in. You know, he's at the door waiting. You have to make that, that opening. You have to, you know, open that door. He's right there. He's ready to take your hand. So a hundred percent and then the miracle, then the miracle. So, and what you would hope though, is that if there are people out there that are almost mindlessly doing things because they think they're right, but they're not offering up real intent. You would hope that in the process, just the process alone, that they would get that spark, that they would realize that there's more to gain than the process itself. It's what the process, it's what the process can facilitate when you offer, offer yourself up spiritually. I have more I could say about this, but I think we'll keep, <laughs> we'll keep going on about the temple and uh, yeah. it will never end. <laughs> but I think we've done quite well with this so far. Really good uh, insights. Um, all right. Do I go again? Okay. So this one is um, a way shorter. A way shorter insight. So you'll you'll note from the um, the in the manual this week it had a like a daily entry, like a daily entry for each day of the um, Easter week. Uh, and so this one is it's I'm, I, I guess I cover a couple of things in this one, but this is Monday, March twenty fifth um, entry in the Come Follow Me manual. It's titled Jesus Christ's appearance in the ancient Americas and. Um, it kind of uh, links to Micah's last insight at the very start when he was kind of um, with an Elder Neil A. Maxwell quote about how the Testament of the Bible and the Book of Mormon, we have we have the both the both of these. And I, I really, um, funnily enough, that's what also really stood out to me this week is how um, gr- uh, grateful, how blessed we are uh, to have this other Testament of the resurrection. In fact, a better Testament of the resurrection. Um, so I'm actually going to just read the section. It's very short, and then I've just got some comments at the end. So um, Jesus Christ's appearance in the ancient Americas. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. And that's in Third Nephi eleven ten. So the Come Follow Me manual says God the Father introduced His beloved Son Jesus Christ to the Nephites and invited them to hear Him. The resurrected Savior then descended and proclaimed that he had completed the atonement and had suffered the will of the Father in all things. The Savior invited the Nephites to feel the prints of the nails in his hands and in his and to know for themselves of his glorious resurrection. After they did so one by one, they cried Hosanna and worshipped him. In the April 2023 General Conference, Elder Gary E. Stevenson invited us to contemplate how the account of the resurrected Saviour's ministry in the Book of Mormon can enhance our Easter celebration. Um, And this must be, I think this is a quote from that talk. Um, And the talk is called The Greatest Easter Story Ever Told. And it says, imagine the Nephites at the temple actually touched the hands of the risen Lord. We hope to make these chapters in 3rd Nephi as much a part of our Easter tradition 
and this is it's funny that Micah also talked about tradition a bit as well. Make uh, the chapters in Third Nephi as much a part of our Easter tradition as Luke two is of our Christmas tradition, because that's very common, right? We, we often will read Luke two um, as part of Christmas because it's that that perfect sort of chapter that you know describes the whole the whole birth of the Savior um, and all of those bits and pieces. Um, but we don't really, I guess, do that as much with Easter. In reality, the Book of Mormon shares the greatest Easter story ever told. I love that because it's it does it's it's a way better version of the events of the resurrection than we get from the Bible. We don't get a lot in the in the New Testament about it. Um, and then he says, "Let it not be the greatest story, greatest Easter story never told." Pretty cool. I invite you to look at the Book of Mormon in a new light and consider the profound witness it bears of the reality of the risen Christ as well as the richness and depth of the doctrine of Christ. So that really stood out to me. I was like, you know, we're very blessed to have this Second Testament. So, and that's what I've said here. So these are my words here. How blessed are we to have another testament of the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ in the Book of Mormon? In fact, we gain far more information from the Book of Mormon about the resurrection um, of our Savior Jesus Christ than we do from the Bible. In the talk um, that was just referenced above by Gary E. Stevenson, um, he talks about Christmas and Easter traditions and how most of us have Christmas traditions and how we can improve in these areas. So he actually goes in that talk and talks about you know all the traditions him and his family have. Um, and they have tons of Christmas, tra Christmas traditions, but far less so on the Easter side. And he says, I feel our family has relied more on going to church to provide the meaningful Christ-centered part of Easter. And then as a family, we have gathered to share in other Easter-related traditions. Now, I wonder how common that is for all of us <laughs> and most of us. And then he goes on to say, it seems we are all trying. I observe a growing effort among Latter-day Saints toward a more Christ-centered Easter. This includes a greater and more thoughtful recognition of Palm Sunday and Good Friday as practiced by some of our Christian cousins. We might also adopt appropriate Christ-centered Easter traditions found in the cultures and practices of countries worldwide. Um, new Testament scholar N.T. Wright suggested we should be taking steps to celebrate Easter in creative new ways in art, literature, children's games, poetry, music, dance, festivals, bells, special concerts. This is our greatest festival. Um, remember that the birth of the Saviour and the whole reason for the Saviour, which we celebrate at Christmas, actually culminates in, in, in the atonement and the resurrection of the Saviour. That's what the actual reason for Christmas was for, so that he could perform the atonement for us. Um, but for some reason, Christmas seems to be the bigger um, festival of celebration. Take Christmas away, and in biblical terms, you lose two chapters at the front of Matthew and Luke, nothing else. Take Easter away, and you don't have a New Testament. You don't have a Christianity. So anyway, that stood out to me. I thought that was really cool. Um, and uh, so here, so here's my final thoughts here. I think I might have mentioned this last year, similar sort of uh, insight at, at Easter time. So my family is continuing our push to celebrate Easter and the atonement and resurrection of our Savior by continuing and adding to our annual family Easter traditions. And as Micah said, I, and I, I agree um, about focusing on the right things at Easter. You know, like, I mean, it's easy to just do fun stuff and eat chocolate, you know, um, but it's also easy to focus these things on Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not, and, and his resurrection. Uh, we, we just, just don't do it. Um, so again, this year, we will, as a family, be having a family dinner of lamb on Good Friday, um, which is tomorrow, right now. And my wife is cooking that right now in the background, and it smells amazing. Um, and that's to remember the Savior's sacrifice as the Lamb of God. And so what I'm, you'll see what I'm getting at here is everything we do over this week is pointing to the Savior. We're trying to, we're trying to focus all on Him to make it all about Him because it's very easy to not do that. Um, on Saturday, we'll again, and we did this last year, we'll be going on a morning hike to remember the Savior taking his cross up to Golgotha. And at the top, we will read related scriptures. And thanks to Gary E. e. Stevenson, we'll ensure that we'll be adding some Book of Mormon passages, uh, probably from Third Nephi, about the Savior's resurrection as well. On Sunday, we'll naturally attend church. And afterwards, we'll have a large family gathering at my wife's parents' house where all her family, all her brothers and sisters and their kids will come. And that's where the typical Easter festivities will happen. 
along with some El Salvadorian ones like Cascarones. I think I explained that last year. Everyone smashes eggshells on each other's heads. It's quite funny. Um, but the beautiful thing about this is that we'll be pointing all of these things to the Savior. And most of my wife's family is less active. Um, and so I think it's a great opportunity to point everyone back to the reason for that, as we say at Christmas, the reason for the season. Um, we can have fun, but we can um, point it back to our Savior. And we'll have a family dinner, which will again be in remembrance of our Savior. And to be honest, I'm grateful that we have these opportunities to, to remember our Savior's atonement and resurrection in multiple family-based activities and traditions over the best long weekend of the year. And I, I think it'll be a great opportunity to, as I've said a couple of times, to, to point everyone in the family back to the Savior. Um, and just again, in reference to the palms, the palms, and I just wanted to end with this, you know, the palm, the palm branches and, and things from my first insight and from third Nephi 11 at the start of this insight, um, where he, he, um, uh, he, the comfort of the manual talks about the savior allowing everyone to feel the prints of the nails in his palms and his feet. Um, I just want to end with this quote from president Nelson from Easter in 2021. He said, and this is worded beautifully, on this Palm Sunday, I invite you to make this coming week truly holy by remembering not just the palms that were waved to honour the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem, but by remembering the palms of his hands. According to Isaiah, the Saviour promised that he will never forget you, saying, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. So I just wanted to point out that we, you know, we need to always remember him. And think of his palms, and he he will, he is not forgetting us. We should not forget him, and try and focus more of our activities over this fun long Easter weekend back to back to him. That's just a really really good synopsis. Perfect timing, perfect message at the perfect time of the year. Um, I love that symbolism of him having graven us in his palms I, that to me is just a there's there's some symbolism in the gospel when you really focus down on it like if if you if you take some of this stuff for granted and just go oh, yeah oh yeah he's still got the marks in his hands or whatever it'll mean nothing but when you really I think when you really understand the atonement of Jesus Christ you are so grateful for it you're so grateful for Jesus Christ and everything that he's done when you remember and think about the fact that you're written on that palm that everything that you've ever experienced he suffered and bled and died for and because of that he still wants to wear he still wants to wear the scar that he did it for you so you'll never forget to me that symbolism is so inspiring to, for me to try and go hey man i can do better like he took all the licks for me how about i'll try and just not dish too many more of those out that he had to take retroactively and then and then another while we're on it while we're on the topic another one of my favorites sacrament meeting has really become an it, an emotional time for me because when i sit down and i take the sacrament i think of the symbolism of his body being under that shroud and i think of the symbolism of when they pass me the bread that i'm i'm eating his flesh and then i'm drinking his blood it's not like we relish in drinking blood or flesh. It's the fact that he's willing to give it to me. You know? How would you feel if, change that position, how would you feel if the person you love most in the entire world was under that shroud? And we were passing around their ability to set you free because of their death. How would you feel towards that person? It's... When you really, really think about the symbolism, it, it is almost overwhelming to me. It is almost overwhelming. So it's, it's so beautiful. And I'm grateful that we have this time of the year specifically set aside to pay a little bit more attention to that. So that was great. The thing, the thing that always comes to my mind when, when talking about um, the, the palms, the hands and him always remembering us and, is I think I mentioned it maybe even last year uh, during the the come fall me uh, with the atonement was the the grape juice the wine I I, I think it's just 
fascinating to me how much of the stuff that we just forget that that even today, right now, I can go and I can uh, pour a, 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 gl a glass of grape juice and I can drink it. And the savior of the whole universe isn't, can't, in fact, do that because he's sworn, he's promised that he won't drink that again until he sits at the table with his disciples in the New Jerusalem and 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 the work is finished at, you know in that regard he's finally given his kingdom and then he shall do it again so the the, the first time he, he he sat down with his disciples the the last supper right and what ended up happening they crucified him he said you know i'm, I'm not going to do this again i'm not going to do this again until i finally get my kingdom until it's real and he and he, he has he has us engraven upon the palms of his hand and he's not he's on a 2000 hour year fast from yeah. from grape juice you know um from something that he probably enjoys you know he was part of the process of creating it and uh not i'm not going to touch it until that day what what an awesome thing and, and and i'm trying to think talking about creating easter traditions that we can remember sacrifice remember the savior sacrifice and and maybe do it ourselves i'm gonna have to come up with something really good with uh grape juice Something involved with the Last Supper in that and just, you know, asking kids like, you know, like how hard, you know, how hard is it to fast for 24 hours from the things, things you love, you know, picture 2000 years, you know, picture, picture that. And uh, I'm gonna have to come up with something. So uh, this is I've I've been recalled to reevaluate my traditions and also see how I can integrate the grape juice. I'm going to I'm going to see about that. <laughs> Nice. Maybe grape soda. Mm, now we're talking. Okay. <laughs> You're not gonna drink grape grape juice again until you drink it with him in the New Jerusalem. All right. Is that it, boys? I might have missed someone. No. Cool, cool. Great insights. Thank you very much for sharing them. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining us again on this wonderful Easter season. We love you very much. We are just so grateful for the season. We're so grateful for our Savior, Jesus Christ. We encourage you to think about some of these things over the season, maybe about how you celebrate and remember the Savior and make that the focus for you and your family. Thank you for taking the time to listen with us today. We feel very blessed to be alive in this wonderful period where the savior will perform one of some of his most wonderful works the marvelous work in the glory the resurrection of a particular person that kicks off the resurrection of our loved ones which then will gather us in physically to zion the new jerusalem and we are zion or bust if that has not been clear or the kingdom of god or nothing as spoken by president taylor we know that the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints is the vehicle to get us there it is it has the prophets. It has the power. It has the authority. It will not be taken away from the earth until the Savior himself comes to take it himself in the new Jerusalem. And we're doing everything we possibly can to be prepared for that day, to look forward to these things, to look forward to the resurrection, to look forward to the return of Joseph Smith. And if you're interested in learning more of these things and joining us for the ride, because it will take all of us combined with our pleas day and night to make these things happen, for the Lord to hear our cries, for him to want to deliver us, for him to want to build that city for us. So let us escape to it. We need to do that together. We can't do it individually. Join us at Zion or Bust, Facebook, Discord. Link's always provided below. Check us out. We love you. Zion can't be built without you. It ain't going to happen without you. Pray day and night for deliverance. Come on board. Stay on board. Don't get off the ship. And we are the... Three, Three brothers. brothers. We'll see you all next week. Enjoy your Easter, everyone. We love you. <laughs>